Hello, everybody. Welcome to RH TV. We're really pleased to have you with us tonight. And we're tackling, I think, a really interesting subject. It's going to have a lot of kind of crossover into the world of mental health. But before we get started um, talking about femtech, let's go to Dave so he can tell you how to join in. So if you've got any questions or there's anything that you want to bring up or comment on, we'd really love to hear from you. So um, over to Dave. Dave, how can people join in? Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Hi, everyone. As always, there's a couple of options to join in tonight. The first is on the Facebook Live feed. Uh, if you just pop in there, pop in your type and uh, obviously anything we can bring in tonight's episode, we will do. Uh, the other option you've got as you're watching along is head to Twitter and use the hashtag MHTV. Uh, we'll be able to see any of the tweets with MHTV in and we will bring them into tonight's conversation. But without further ado, straight back to you, Nikki. Fantastic. So to our guest, Lindsay, please can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, thank you so much for having me on uh, this evening, um, both Dave and Nikki. It's it's really great to be here, and I'm excited to share a bit of what I've been working on and, and hopefully contribute to sort of a larger conversation around um, mental health and the digital and, and women's health in particular. Um, I'm a researcher in the Center for Post-Digital Cultures at Coventry University here in the UK. Uh, I've been with the CPC for about a year and a half now, originally from Canada, where I completed a, a PhD in cultural studies and philosophy. Uh, and my interests have shifted somewhat since then uh, via a, a variety of sort of roundabout uh, routes post-PhD. Post I did a, a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in New York City and taught in Montreal at Concordia University for a few years before landing here uh, in the UK at Coventry. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to be part of the Center for Post-Digital Cultures and um, to be working in the area of women's digital health from really a kind of intersectional feminist and, and cultural studies perspectives. So yeah, really happy to be here and um, excited for you know whatever comes out of this conversation tonight. So thank you for having me. Really, no, we're really, really pleased to have you. So why don't we get started by just describing a little bit, what is femtech? Yeah, that's a great question because it's it's this really sort of popular um, shorthand for describing really a, a wide variety of kind of um, conditions and scenarios. And, you know, uh, the best way I could describe femtech is kind of uh, an aspect of overall digital health that, that focuses on women. Um, but of course, not also exclusively on women or those who might identify uh, as such. Um, but to backtrack a little bit by digital health, what we're really talking about is these new and innovative ways for monitoring uh, our health and our well-being uh, that provides access and sort of self-management tools for health-related issues. Ideally, these tools will empower us to you know, track and manage and improve our health and care environments. Um, this can lead to greater independence and improved health and mental health outcomes. It can reduce inefficiencies in, in health and care delivery, improve access, reduce costs, uh, improve the quality of care, and, and really make health services more person-centered um, and individualized for, for people's and especially women's unique health needs. Um, and so digital health is sort of access to mental, physical, sexual health services through online or digital applications is critical and absolutely has the potential to transform healthcare in general, especially for women. And I think more than, than ever in an era where uh, we've seen regular access to doctors and pharmacies uh, really being curtailed or, or limited, women are turning to technology for, for their health needs. So Femtech is sort of responding to this need. And, and there are certainly some, some issues with the naming of these technologies. And not, maybe we can talk about this if, right. if folks are interested, you know, beginning with the fact that many users aren't necessarily going to identify with this sort of fem prefix, right? But we do call this industry femtech. This is a shorthand for feminine technologies mm -hmm. and really represents a wide range of, of products from, you know, wearable products like Fitbit and the Apple Watch, um, monitoring apps like, uh, like ovulation trackers and menstruation trackers. Um, a few years ago, MIT had a contraceptive mic microchip in development, which was really interesting, this little sort of scrabble 
tile sized chip that could be implanted for uh, up to almost two decades and remotely controlled, you know, turn, turned on and off by a switch. Um, <laughs> this, this kind of technology is only increasing in, mm. in scope and capacity. And so this industry is really, really booming. Um, mm. I think, can I share just one okay. stat that, you know, in, in 2019, the, the global market for femtech represented about a, almost a $19 billion U.S. Um, industry and it's predicted to be worth about $60 billion by 2027, which sounds like a lot, right? Like that's a huge amount of money. And we can't deny these critical leaps forward that the industry is 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 taking and has made. Um, but really that still only represents a very small fraction of the overall digital health market, which so if we if we think of that $60 billion number that's projected well the, the projection overall um if you take women out of the equation is is almost 230 billion dollars in the same time span so almost quadruple so i think it's really interesting that um during the pandemic we've seen this aspect of women's digital health grow and and the availability of femtech has increased steadily over the last decade but it's really been during covid that we've seen this acceleration mm -hmm. uh, as women have identified this need for discrete portable and accessible digital health tools that can be used in a kind of self monitoring um capacity so um that's really I guess what femtech is and and maybe a, a very brief snapshot of, of where it's going um but it's definitely a kind of emerging technology or set of technologies and, a, and an emerging market and it's really exciting but also something that as we'll talk about i think needs to be approached with a lot of a lot of care and a lot of caution at the same time definitely definitely there's so many things i want to ask about so i'm just trying to get it in order it's such an it's and there's, there's so many different things in there but the one is this kind of like the kind of female market you know when you when you're developing things because you're saying absolutely this is a small section in some ways and it kind of runs the risk of everything like razors you know we'll just make it pink and charge yeah. extra for it <clears throat> and that's basically how all that stuff has gone but it also speaks a lot to the I think the kind of echoes and parallels you see in mental health at the moment because across healthcare we know that people need to be more engaged in their health we know that we're more pushing towards kind of primary care public health um <clears throat> and also people are very invested in their own health they want ways to have more control over their mm -hmm. understanding of what's happening to them and we've got some really amazing apps that have come out but also mm -hmm. some that have clearly been designed by people maybe who are more expert perhaps in technology than people <laughs> and, and people's health needs. Yeah. So, and, and it's very easy as well because the NHS has got a terrible reputation for managing its IT. You know, it just seems to buy the worst, clunkiest, least fit for purpose things. So it's quite interesting to see the innovation outside of that kind of structure. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when anything happens outside of that structure, you've also it brings concerns as well, doesn't it, about how we keep, monitor, save people's data, particularly around things like women's bodies or, or our health yes. generally, but also our mental health, which still has quite a lot of stigma attached to it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So what what are you seeing as the key benefit? Can we have some examples first, some examples of kind of the, the, the apps that you're seeing that have been like the most popular, you're saying ovulation trackers and things like that? Yeah, definitely the the industry, and this is is mostly as a result of of um, following the money, right? So the most popular apps are 100. percent They're uh, fitness trackers. Mm -hmm. um, we know the fitness industry mm -hmm. is, you know, it's 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 not going anywhere <laughs> for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, period of menstruation trackers, which mm -hmm. is uh, again kind of a in many ways, a capitalization on a, a kind of biological process that we don't really have a lot of control over, right? Um, and uh, fertility, ovulation kind of apps and, and digital products. I mean, the fertility industry, even outside uh, self-monitoring apps is, is huge. You know, people spend millions of dollars in in the attempt to sort of increase fertility and, and chances of conception and all of that so these are definitely the most popular uh the most profitable and the most heavily invested in sort of categories within this sort of if we can call it a niche market of of femtech um which is great 
it's it's wonderful. I think the, the benefits for um, for women and for folks that identify as women to access these kind of resources uh, on their own and sort of take control over their own healthcare and healthcare management. I think it's fantastic. Um, but there's definitely a lot of aspects of women's health that tend to get overlooked in this process. You know, women are much more than than menstruation and childbearing, right? Yeah. So you're talking about the kind of like almost bikini health, isn't it? So people are like sure. fits, and that's what people are interested in. And then the rest of your body that falls outside that is meh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, 100%. And, and that's what people seem to be more uh, interested in investing in. Also, these these are the the, the topics or the, what, what did you call it? The bits and... Bikini health bits. Yeah, bikini health. These, these are the things that sort of gain traction um, in terms of the investment discourse because they're, although women's health in general, I think is grossly misunderstood, mm -hmm. um, these aspects of women's health are the more intelligible ones. They're the ones that make sense. Once we start talking about um, um, endometriosis or, or menopause or sexual health or sexual trauma and recovery, mm. that those we start to sort of broach those taboo or, or stigmatized territories where it, it's not as fun to talk about, right? So they, they tend to get avoided both in terms of investment and in terms of just sort of the general discourse around the, the industry as a whole. Yeah. Interesting. So what do you think the most the, the benefits are going to come from this? For the stuff that's working, what's working really well at the moment? There's a lot that's that's working really well. You know, Femtech is sort of entering into this scenario where we know that women are routinely living longer than men. They're requiring more comprehensive quality and, and targeted later in life care. Th this we know. We also know that women are much less likely to prioritize their own care above that of their, their families and, and other commitments. Uh, we know that women are less likely to seek care in a kind of traditional environment. So Femtech is entering the healthcare uh, I guess, scenario at, at, at a time in the market's really ready for it and women are demanding it. And, and you'll notice that when I talk, I use a lot of words like ideally and can and this kind of possibilizing language. Yeah. And I'm sure you can sense there's maybe a but coming yeah. here, but I do oh, want to <laughs> I really do want to emphasize the, the potential uh, positive aspects of this kind of, of intervention and the potential consumer uptake like it's huge you know yeah. um the femtech as as an industry that prioritizes women's health and, and gives unprecedented access for women to monitor their own health and their own health care and make decisions for themselves i mean that's that's incredible that's that's what we want, right? And especially as most of these products are being finally designed by women for yeah. women and sort of circumnavigating this one size fits all model of healthcare where it's been designed by men for men. Mm -hmm. um, so the the potentials here are mm -hmm. they're expansive and it, it is really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't want to do I don't want to get to the butt part yet, but <laughs> I want to acknowledge that this is this is great. There's really, really great work. Yeah. done there's some amazing products there's some amazing networks and, and ceos and startups and people mm. that are really fighting kind of tooth and nail for funding to to bring this kind of mm. uh health to the women who really need it mm. most and mm. it's it is really exciting to see mm. i guess as well you know if we're looking at you know women who are living longer and they're getting more complex needs and they're needing um different kinds of support we're gonna have to do a lot to make sure that that generation are as confident to use apps and all the other things that could really change their health status and the other thing i think particularly around the sort of gathering of data is the building of communities i can see that being really supportive because even mm -hmm. now you see sort of like facebook and things being used for people with long-term conditions and that's mm -hmm. really making such a difference in breaking down isolation sharing stories um, stopping people feeling so afraid and alone with with difficult issues, you know, even things like urinary incontinence, sort of menopause issues, stuff like that. And I think you see it across a lot of kind of slightly stigmatized areas of health, including sort of mental health and things like that. Just being able to share 
and not be alone and not being isolated. And the thing about trackers that stands out to me is how many women, particularly women of colour, go into their GPs talking about pain and are ignored or downplayed. And, and it sounds... It, <laughs> I bet in any money, if they went in with a tracker that evidenced that this is my experience, mm -hmm. it would be taken more seriously in their voice. And that's devastatingly sad and annoying mm -hmm. that people aren't mm -hmm. seen as reliable witnesses to their own bodies. But on the mm -hmm. other hand, if it gets pain medication sorted out properly, if it gets, you know, people taken seriously when they're reporting symptoms, I think there might be some positives in that as well. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I mean, there's sort of two issues that are mm -hmm. at play in what in what you're talking about, and the the first is is completely research supported, it, and it is that you know we overwhelmingly find that that women, and I would also say gender diverse uh, folks, are still chronically underrepresented in say clinical trials, um, women's physical and mental health are routinely ignored or diminished. And, and this system that has always kind of skewed male and away from the very specific needs that, that women have has serious consequences in terms of misdiagnosis, delays in treatment, um, all these kinds of things. We also know that these new sort of technologies that are coming into play return the ownership of women's bodies back to women. Um, and so rather than relying on somebody else's knowledge or somebody else's diagnosis or somebody else's interpretation of, of that experience, women are starting to come to terms with the fact that they know their bodies better than anybody. And they have for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and so this, these digital health products really have the potential to kind of pick up on uh, not, not giving women new knowledge that they didn't have before, but kind of rewarding them or acknowledging the, the knowledge and the sense of self that women have always had, um, but that has maybe gone uh, under-recognized or, or ignored or stigmatized and, and things like that. So you were sort of saying about kind of the, the designers and the design of. Can we talk a little bit about co-production in, in terms of how how frequent is that? And is it something that's common or do, is it sort of like one woman gets asked in the end to say that they like it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think every good product before it goes to market undergoes a, a somewhat serious and, and rigorous sort of um uh, focus group sort of testing scenario. Um, but I, in my personal opinion, this happens a little bit too late in the game. Often uh, potential users are brought in to engage with uh, maybe a prototype of some sort that is already almost completely designed. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're trying to do with the project we're currently working on um, at Coventry and in, in conjunction with a, a couple of the femtech networks, global femtech networks, and, and some researchers at Massey University in New Zealand mm -hmm. is starting to engage these user stakeholders at the very, very beginning of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is sort of the foundational principle of, of co-design or, or co-production is that uh, talking to, to potential users at the beginning of a design project and involving them at every sort of step or every sort of mm -hmm. part of that um, development life cycle will ultimately result in, in a better product, more usable product, a safer product, mm -hmm. um, a more efficient product overall. So I think that like co-design is I'm a, I'm a huge um, advocate. I, I, I'm not a designer. Mm. Um, so all I do is kind of sit on the outside and, and push and poke a little bit. But that is definitely sort of one of the core aspects of what we're trying to do with our research is really try to involve users, but also policymakers, also think tanks, healthcare providers, um, at, at every stage of that design process, rather than bringing these these people in at the, at the very end to say, this is already developed, you know, what do you think about it when it's really too late mm. to change it? I think sometimes those questions are more 
Mm. not what do you think about it, but are you going to buy this? Mm. What sort of little tweaks do we need to make in order for you mm. to buy it? Rather than really thinking from the beginning, well, how can this product best serve mm. this population? Mm -hmm. It's an interesting one as well because I think mental health has long grappled with its issues around power and control and sharing and co-design and having really meaningful co-production where people are not just, again, as you say, brought in the last minute to go, do you want it in blue or green? And <laughs> it's much yeah. more, um, do you what do you need? What would help you? Those yeah. kind of conversations I think happen quite late. And it's been really interesting to see, particularly in, in the, the mental health apps, is people have designed what's easy to design, not necessarily what will be incredibly useful for people to have. And that's, mm. or else they've taken something that has been in the fitness market or in <clears throat> a relaxation or something like that, and then pulled it across and sort of rebranded it. Yeah. You can, and you can see that, I think, in, in kind of like fitness particularly. So you start off with like a running app and they make it for women. And it's like, if you think you're going to get killed, do you want to share where you're being killed so that people can find your body afterwards? You're like, I wonder if we could design a different app. Didn't involve me getting killed. <laughs> and then, you know, that kind of like looking at, at how stuff can be repositioned and how um, apps can be repurposed. And that's, yeah. I think, really interesting as well. Because in, in mental health, it, it it's very scattergun, you know, and then you think, the other thing that I think that bothers me as well about is where does data go when you input it? And I think a lot of people don't know how to ask those questions and, and sort of like evaluate their apps. And I wonder if we could, we'll have a look at some of the issues first and then maybe come on to looking at um, kind of the quality management. So if you're going to be as a professional recommending an app or if you are going to be considering using it for your personal use, what kind of things you'd have to think through? That would be really helpful to have a look at. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> This is such a tricky question because we're we're dealing with a, a potential uh, pool of users who are accessing a product um, often under duress, under extreme stress, possibly in a moment of trauma or or crisis. Um, and I think all of us, if if I ask the question, you know, who's ever signed up for something without? you know, reading the terms and conditions. We're all reading our hands, right? I don't this think happens. I've ever read the terms and conditions. I could have sold my kidneys 10 times over. <laughs> Maybe, right? I mean, we'll, we'll never know until that call comes in. Um, <laughs> but I think it's fair to say that we all sort of take for granted the fact that we sort of breeze through those, that 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 paperwork or, or whatever, um, in order to, to get the access quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Um and so I think when we're talking about women's health, when we're talking about mental health, when we're talking about particularly stigmatized or, you know, quote unquote taboo or at risk forms of, of health or, or vulnerable populations that might be accessing these kinds of products, yeah. um, most often in a time of sort of uh, immediate need and, and crisis, mm -hmm. nobody's reading the fine print. Mm. Um, and this is really concerning. You know, I, I attended a webinar last week where a, an OBGYN told a story, and I'll give an example here, about a young woman in Latin America, um, so desperate for birth control that she didn't care what information she was plugging in uh, to, to the app. She didn't care about where her details were going, if that product she was receiving had any kind of quality control or quality standards, or if her data might be sold off to, you know, a third party. Um, and I think we tend to think about femtech as being used by women in very privileged positions, but it's also used by women who don't have anywhere else to go. And sadly, some of these products, especially the ones that are free, I'm afraid, yeah. um, can be almost predatory in their in their privacy and their security policies or or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And I think the same really goes for for mental health. When these products are accessed in a moment of crisis, users are not thinking about their safety or their privacy or where their information is going. If they're giving consent to something, it's because they need to get to that next stage of intervention that might save their life, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that is our job to make these. Yeah. Uh, gaps in in consent and data privacy really really transparent and, and demand that these digital health products especially for women and vulnerable or at risk mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. are subject to a, a more intense kind of regulation mm -hmm. um, because we can't expect the people who need these products most 
to be doing that that work for us. I, I believe that's that's our job as academics, as regulators, as developers and, and designers and, and CEOs. I truly do. Because even if you look at the way terms and conditions are written, they're written in such a way that you give up before you actually get to the bit that you probably should have read. So if there's not, there's not really a structure to say this is essential information. You know, like you would if you're giving any other kind of information that it was really vital for people to understand, you'd structure it in a way that mm -hmm. brought the most important salient points first. And you know that that's not what's happening with terms and conditions. They're trying to weigh you down. So you just tick the box. Yeah, it really is sort of a war of, of attrition by over information, right? Yeah. Um, and that's that's only speaking about the, the apps that do have some kind of protocol or fine print in place. Many don't. Mm -hmm. and, and by law right now, at least in the UK, they don't actually have to. <laughs> which is maybe it's quite alarming to be honest mm -hmm. yeah so we've talked about some of the sort of gaps is there anything else you want to bring on that or should we move on to accessibility i can see we've got some questions coming in as well oh great i mean accessibility is is a big gap i don't know if there's questions around that and i can i can save talking a, a, about it until then but i i guess very briefly mm. to talk about accessibility and we can unpack it a bit more is um when people ask sort of, well, what are the access barriers? I always, I, I like to answer a question with a question a little bit, you know, and say, well, if we really think about it, who is Femtech for? Who is it really for? So in the academic literature, for example, very little attention is given to these, what I would call intersections of race, yeah. class, sexual, uh, sexu sexuality and ability mm -hmm. in, in products that largely assume a, a white audience, a heterosexual audience, affluent, childbearing, able-bodied. Mm -hmm. This is the typical user profile. And so I think Femtech as a whole, and there are exceptions, leaves out a, a significant portion of, of the, the very population that it sort of paradoxically proposes to positively impact, right? right. Um, so I think access um, access is a, it, it really is a big deal, particularly when the apps that are, say, the, the most easy to come by or, or the least expensive are the ones that tend to have the least regulation around mm. medical accuracy and, and data privacy. Mm. So yeah, ac access for sort of marginalized folks or, or underserved mm. populations and, and women is it's it's really a critical issue and it's something that's being worked on, but um, it's it's difficult mm -hmm. without the the sort of policy to back it up because there's um, it, it's not a money maker yeah. <laughs> to be to be really blunt about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's the thing, isn't it? When you're you're looking at so many interventions what often is funded or what is often pushed forward is the stuff that's going to make money. So yeah. diet and exercise, I was like, hmm, can we take a pill at all? <laughs> diet and exercise sounds like no fun. So it's, <laughs> it's a funny kind of, it's not, it's not necessarily what works best that, that goes to the fore. Yeah. But I can see we've got people coming in. Dave, did you want to ask some questions or did you want me to read them? What would you prefer? Yeah, no, no, I'm happy to ask questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's been really interesting listening along. And, and I suppose as someone that's really interested in technology, uh, mm -hmm. it's been great to kind of focus a bit more on the, the femme side of the technology. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, the things that I've been thinking is, uh, you know, one of those sad people that kind of enjoys to watch the Apple keynote presentations uh, from California uh, every sort of like six months. Uh, it's been really good to see that the diversity of people on the stage has, has changed. And you kind of think that that actually has, or it seems to have influenced the, the stuff that they're putting out there, that, you know, it, it, it does seem to be much kind of more, you know, built for much, much wider, uh, sort of a, a much wider odds. And I think, like you say, there's a real incentive for them to do that, isn't there? That why would you want to exclude 50% of your potential, you know, people who want to buy something uh, but you would also also hope that there is that kind of you know you know belief in doing something but positive mm -hmm. as well yeah uh, so we, we've had a few questions in uh just let me get the right screen uh so the first thing i've got to say is catherine springthorpe has said yeah. dr Lindsay is the best ever so uh, <laughs> i think that, that that's a, a very sort of strong uh, you know okay. support of you uh, but she's also put a comment in uh saying a friend of mine is a recovery nurse told me that yeah. most women who have had surgery for endometriosis wake up and just cry from relief that their symptoms weren't 
them overreacting and they had finally been listened to. Endometriosis is never caught early. I really do hope something can be developed for help. But as Dr. Lindsay says, this area of women's health isn't sexy to talk about. Uh, and then Susie's responded to that. Uh, a relative of mine suffers from endometriosis, but the doctors tend not to listen to her when it comes to pain. She has now been given birth control, which has given her weight gain, which is causing depression. So I, I think, you know, kind of responding to that comment she made earlier about uh, pain and, and how you can kind of record pain and maybe if it's on a, a little screen, you know, someone's more likely to believe you yeah. than, than saying anything. But I don't know if you've got any further thoughts about those comments. Yeah, I do. I mean, the yeah, I, I mean, I agree and I I, I empathize and, and I think it, this only supports the what the research is showing us or the, the sort of narrative experience of women that that their concerns, their pain is is, you know, ignored or diminished in some cases. Uh, it's often treated with completely inappropriate forms of, of intervention, hormone therapies and, and things like that. And it's absolutely heartbreaking to, to hear a story like that where, where it takes somebody coming out of surgery to finally find relief. The relief is only found at the very, very sort of end of that road and, and, and not earlier on and and uh, and I understand that the, that the sort of pain associated with those conditions might might continue but just to be heard and listened to um, would be an incredible source of, of relief you know the the fact that somebody wakes up from surgery and that's the first time that they feel like their you know their health challenge has been addressed like that's devastating and and it should never ever get get to that point and and my hope is that these digital health interventions will give women that voice back to to have those those symptoms and that pain and that discomfort and, and those experience you know recognized and there's only so much that say an app can do it can't perform a, a surgery right but I think just just to feel like like those concerns are are heard and they're validated, I, I think is is a huge kind of first step. And and one of the things that that Fantech I think has the, has the potential to do. Yeah, uh, another question that we've had come in uh, about the Zoe COVID app. Obviously, you know that's been kind of something that's probably really mainstream recording health information on mobile devices, uh, contributing to kind of the bigger surveys that, you know, the potential to do that. I was just looking at the screen now, uh, even though that's not showing up, uh, 4.7 4 million people have contributed to that so far. Uh, I suppose it, it's whether you've got kind of ideas of how as, as, as resources like that branch out into wider health, uh, how that might be kind of supported in terms of femtech, what kind of you know, maybe diseases or issues will will kind of benefit from that huge amount of data that can be collected. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'm not uh, totally familiar with this this particular um, app. I'm trying to Google it really quickly, but I won't, I won't be able to come to come to terms with it that fast enough to give a really comprehensive um, response. I, I could just give a bit of background. The, 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 the Zoe COVID app, it's one where uh, they ask people to contribute if they've got COVID or not. Uh, so you can kind okay. of report, you can report daily in terms of your health, uh, whether you feel well or not. Uh, obviously, you know, at one point, if people were, say, feeling like they had a cold, they could put on there and then they could right. take a, a lateral flow test and, and then they could sort of, contribute the results in that as well so okay. obviously it's a, it's a huge way of, of kind of collecting a massive amount of data yes. from the population and what they could um, then say was you know you know say a few weeks ago one in 19 people in the population has covid because of our huge amount of data that we that we can make that that kind of assessment uh, and, yeah. and i suppose is that bit into it about we you know most of us have got one of these in our pockets now uh, and it's it's you know sort of 10 15 years ago it would be kind of like a desktop computer wasn't it whereas now it's mm -hmm. a, a a tiny device that we we carry everywhere with us mm -hmm. uh, and and i suppose you know how will that kind of you know the the the, the speed of, of progress kind of impact on femtech 
Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I mean, honestly, this is only the beginning, right? And and these kinds of um, what I would call a kind of self tracking system, uh, it, it sets a really interesting precedent um, in the way that it uh, naturalizes a, a kind of giving of your own personal information uh, and a kind that it sort of responsibilizes citizens. Uh, for other people's well-being. And so um, from, from what I understand, this sort of Zoe COVID app, it, it's it's really mobilized in a time of public health crisis where we're being told that we are all responsible for sort of the safety of the the, the group, the collective, right? Um, and that it's, it's up to us um, and any information that we share is for the greater good. And that is very true. And, and if, if we're going to make it to translate into femtech, if we're going to make these products better and safer and more efficient and more accessible, we do need that data. We really do. Data is, is power. It's, it's currency. Um, it's, it is what is going to sort of propel the industry forward. And we can't do it without that. So my argument is not for the sort of relinquishing as, as, of data as a... Um, sort of category of analysis or, or a, 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 a pr propulsion of, of innovation. Not at all. Um, what I am really interested in is sort of how these companies and products, whether it's a COVID tracking app or, or a femtech period tracker, um, responsibilizes women in particular um, for the for the greater good. Uh, and so I, I think we've seen this a lot with with COVID and I, I think it's important. I, you know, I, I believe in public health. I do feel that there was indeed a public health crisis. Um, but again, and this is maybe my sort of feminist uh, theory background coming coming out. I, I think there's sort of two things that emerge out of this kind of the, the self tracking of, of public health. One one is that it responsibilizes women in particular, uh, women who have always sort of carried the burden of taking care of their communities and their families and, and their households. Um, and it sets a really really interesting precedent in terms of uh, how and to what ends data can be used, even on a voluntary basis. Um, and again, I don't, I mean, I'd love to read through the kind of um, privacy policies and, and the terms of conditions of, of that app to see sort of what are people actually consenting to when they're, when they're sharing their information. Um, I don't think it's fair that, that consumers or, or users have to make a choice between their data privacy and protecting other people in a public health context. I, I don't think that's a, that's a fair decision. Um, I think we need to find a way to bring those things closer together so that people can support a public health initiative, especially in a time of pandemic, um, while having the assurances that the data they provide is, is safe and secure and will be erased upon their consent or, you know, and, and so forth. I, I think there's a way to make both of those things happen. I'm just, yeah. I'm just not sure we're there yet. Yeah, no, I think it's a fascinating one because uh, obviously the England started to develop its own sort of COVID uh, tracking app uh, and they, they quite quickly kind of shelved that uh, mm. in preference to the Apple-Google kind of, you know, combined one that, that seemed to have ironically much less kind of sticky data that they could, they could kind of find from people. Mm. Now, Nikki, I know you've had a couple of extra questions in, so yeah. I don't know if you want to ask them. Yes. Oh, what? It's all caps. Oh, good. Okay. So, <laughs> coming at you, signed annoyed. <laughs> Why is women's health got to be sexy, it says. Which, and I can see your point, angry and annoyed person, because, like, we don't go around asking, like, cancer patients to, like, be hotties, do we? So there is something quite strange about this expectation that somehow it's going to be interesting or special in that way. Lindsay, did you want to ask that? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, it's a tough one, thing. right? I wish there was like an investor on this panel yeah. and we could sort of pick their brain about like what motivates somebody to to invest in a product that, that A, might not make them money, 
uh, is about a sort of a taboo or stigmatized or, or mm -hmm. very intimate detail of, of women's health. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it is tricky. And, and I think it, it, the, it sort of leads me back, honestly, into sort of a larger discussion around um, how women are sort of uh, treated and perceived in, in the public eye, about what it means to be sort of a, 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 a normal um, woman, about body image, about sort of norms around sex and gender. I think the, the, the sort of discourse around gender that we see in the representation of gender that we see in popular culture that we see in um, our workplaces in our places of education directly translate or, or filter down in, into something like the femtech industry and i mean i do think that by sort of investment standards femtech as a whole is a sexy topic i think it's very marketable I think if if I was working for a marketing and communications firm, my head would be exploding with all the sort of potential avenues for for exploiting the connection between women and the digital and, and digital health. Um, but that stops once we cross the boundary from sort of the the normative into the into the non normative, and and I think that change um, needs to needs to start on a more sort of sociocultural level, to be honest. I, I think femtech is, is a reflection of larger sociocultural attitudes around gender and around health and, and mm -hmm. really is the recipient of a, of a trickle down mm -hmm. effect. So exactly. it's designed by people and people live in society. So apps reflect our society. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, why is, why is health in general designed by men for men it, it's 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 because that's how our world order is kind of structured right mm -hmm. femtech was never designed women's health was never yeah. designed to be run by sort of men and this is not an indictment of of men men deserve mm -hmm. amazing health care and yeah. health products mm -hmm. also and there's a lot of amazing um allyship happening within the femtech uh, market oh, yeah. by men for women. Like it's, it's really, it's really amazing. Um, but it's, it's, it's not femtech itself that is, that is creating gender equality. It's, it's a reflection of the gender equalities that have existed for a long time. Um, and, and I think femtech is just trying to catch up and, and surpass or exceed or do something different. Um, but yeah, 100%, like femtech does not need to be sexy or marketable or it, it shouldn't. Yeah. Um, it shouldn't. And yeah, again, I wish I, wish I could pick an investor's brain right now on this, <laughs> Absolutely. On this question. So we've got another couple and I can see the time is getting away from us. So we're going to have sure, to sure. We have a tiny bit. Sorry, everybody. But the the, the question from Catherine from, from, from Wales, um, of Wales, where medical care is patchy, we're having to travel into England or long distances for specialist help, getting excited about the possibilities of femtech. So that's another thing, isn't it? And that mm -hmm. you can allow people to choose. Suppose you're with a GP or surgery or you don't enjoy their care. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go and do that? And the yeah. thing is about balance. Yeah, if you've got specialist care, you can access it from wherever you are. You don't need to be living next door to it or traveling to it. Yeah. And I think what what uh, the pandemic has shown us is that we don't need the sort of proximity that we've grown accustomed to in terms of, of going to see our GP and our, our regular healthcare providers and our pharmacists. Um, I think I mean, for all of the challenges of, of COVID, it's actually revealed some really significant opportunities in, in this industry for, for women to have so much more choice in, in their healthcare than, than they've ever, ever had. So there's just so much potential there and, mm -hmm. and yeah. distance is not a deterrent anymore. No, it kind of takes on to this. Uh, I think we have to make this the last question, but um, it's okay. a fabulous one. <laughs> if Dr. Lindsay was going to inter, uh, make an app, invent an app, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lindsay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this this is my this is my um 
my pipe dream, I guess. So mm -hmm. our, our current research project right now is looking at gendered and domestic violence as a, not to end on a on a no, no, no. It's on a really serious note, but looking at gender. It's mental health. Don't worry, we don't worry about that. Yeah, looking at gendered and domestic <laughs> violence um, as uh, both a, a, a challenge and desperate need of of some kind of significant overhaul of of the health interventions. Um, but also as a significant opportunity for a digital health intervention. Um, and so I think that would be my ultimate goal is to, I'm not a designer, but to work with designers, with a startup, with a, with a kind of maybe an angel investor who actually wants to invest in a kind of philo phil philanthropic <laughs> sense. Maybe this would be a not-for-profit venture probably um, initially. Um, but to develop, uh, I, I would say, a suite of digital tools um, for survivors of gendered and domestic violence that takes them from reporting to, to recovery, to, to wellness and, and, and sexual wellness recovery, um, a, a sort of a series of, of products or, or phases or a, what I would call a suite of, of digital health interventions um, that not only recognizes uh, gendered violence as a, a critical uh, health and mental health issue, um, but also possibilizes the digital as a new kind of, of intervention that is safe, that is affordable, and that brings recovery to the women who need it most. Great. Um, it kind of takes us on to our last sort of like area, because I think we do need to have a think about some of the, the issues that has, you know, Dave's pointed out, we have a little WhatsApp going on the side. <laughs> Um, calorie uh, trackers contributing to eating disorders, things like that. Okay. Um, and just this idea about what would people need to understand to ensure that they were getting something that was good quality? So anything that can keep people a bit safer about make decisions? Yeah, I, again, I, I think this is really the responsibility of um, the, the developer. Um, and even beyond that, the responsibility of, of governments. And I, I can't provide a kind of global overarching sort of thing because every government has, it, has its own regulations. And, and there are measures in place in the UK, for example, and, and the UK does have one of the most kind of robust uh, compliance schemes in terms of, of data privacy and, and medical accuracy and all these kinds of things. Um, but I, for me at all, it, it comes down to, to policy. That, that that is that is what's needed. We need these regulations to actually be enshrined in in law. Um, you know, there's 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 something like it's a crazy number. There's something like 61 percent of of period trackers, for example, uh, had inaccurate information um, and and were not uh, medically certified. Mm. Right. Um, there's actually only one, only one menstruation tracker in the UK that is registered with the Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, because femtech operates within this sort of gray area or or loophole where it's not considered a device or a strict medical intervention. So so any kind of certification or or accreditation is encouraged but not enforced. So my primary target would be to put just put pressure on on these regulatory bodies and, and these governments to to enshrine these regulations in into actual law so that the good apps the ones that are needed the ones that are accessible um, the ones that are efficient and, and actually help women uh, and are safe get to market mm -hmm. uh, and the predatory ones don't. And, and I think just that's really recognizing nice for that, so that's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, digital health, I think, should, is a human right in mm. my mind. Digital health yeah. is a human right, but we need to go about it the the right way. And if this is our future, yeah. uh, we we really need to get it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Before it grows and grows and grows. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. That's a really good place for us to, I think, to finish up on. So let's um, just, we'll pop around to everybody and see if there's anything anyone wants to add, any little sort of last sort of like thoughts people want to leave with this, anything like that. And also we'll be tweeting out again your um, conversation um, blog because it's really useful, I think, for people to Yeah, see. great. Yeah, thank you. 
So if yeah. anyone's really interested in this and they, they they want to go back and have another look at this subject, there's a lot more kind of detail being able to go into and specifically mm -hmm. looking at Lindsay's work there. Mm -hmm. And I think my contact info is in there as well. Yeah. yeah um, Dave, is there anything you wanted to add or say? No, I, I think just as always, it's been a, a great conversation tonight. Uh, it certainly made me think about some of these you know, really important issues. And as someone that does love their tech, it's really nice to hear from someone that's so passionate about it uh, and obviously absolutely knows what they're talking about. So uh, certainly <laughs> been a been food for thought for me tonight. So uh, really thank yeah. you for that, Lindsay. Yeah, thank you. Tech is good. Tech is good. <laughs> Let's not forget that. This is the, the this should be the takeaway. These are absolutely. tech is good. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I, I suppose just you know, just as an example, you know, myself, uh, I had a, an implantable loop recorder for a few years, uh, and back then, you know, I could only download the information by putting this big device on it, and yeah. that connected over the phone via a dial-up thing and all that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure if I had one today, it'd be so much more advanced and and so mm -hmm. much better. And 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 it, it, you know, people like you working in this space hopefully will mean that the stuff that comes next will absolutely blow our minds with how you know yeah, how positive fun. it. Can can be. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I hope so. That's Is there anything, any little like last messages you wanted to add, Lindsay, before we head out? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think I've said it all. Just, just this is this is not meant to be a sort of downer on on technology. We have an incredible tool, you know, at our disposal, and and like any tool, you know, like a hammer can be used to to build a house, and it can be used to bludgeon someone. Right? It's it's really about how we use that tool, and and I think that. Yeah, that's that's where I would end things off. That we just need to be really, really cautious and and considerate about um, how powerful these these things are, and and use them in the in the most sort of inclusive and accessible and ethical way possible. Love it. But I don't think anyone can top that as a last statement. Thank you very <laughs> much. Next week, we've got Jonathan Beebe, and we're talking about celebrating learning disability. Mm -hmm. So another sort of parallel topic, but I think you find it very interesting. So thank you very much um, for, for being with us tonight, audience, and joining in. It's been really lovely to have that kind of conversation. It's felt very, um, very open to do that. So thank you very much, yeah, and good night, all. Yeah, thank you. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.